Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by Allstate and the Searle Funds at the Chicago Community Trust. Good evening y bienvenidos to Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. I'm Alex Hernandez of Univision Chicago Primera Hora, which airs every weekday morning at 5 and 6. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us on the show tonight. As Ward Remapping debates Royal City Council, we'll take a look at how Ward boundaries can affect the everyday lives of Chicagoans. America's Latinos have money to spend, but companies don't always know how to connect with them. We break it down with local marketers. Visiting a Pilsen shop that combines classic and contemporary culture for a unique shopping experience. If you take a look around, there aren't many people that look like me in the industry. And architect Alicia Ponce offers la última palabra on why she believes inclusivity and green buildings go hand in hand. First off tonight, it's worth remapping season once more in Chicago. The 2020 census revealed the city's changing racial makeup, a 5% uptick in the Latino population, a whopping 30% increase in the Asian population, and a 10% decrease in the black population has translated into factions fighting for words mapped to maintain a racial majorities and ensure proportionate racial representation. There's no excuse for members of the city council to ignore city population data when drawing a fair map. Chicago is now 30% Latino. It is the largest racial ethnic population in this city, and the map should have 15 Latino majority wards to reflect that. In this city, we need our new map to reflect the population changes that have happened in Chicago. From Washington DC this week, Mayor Lori Lightford characterized the ward remapping process as a quote, insider game that Chicago residents are largely unconcerned with. But research indicates that carving up communi communities among multiple words can have very real effects on how those neighborhoods function every day. Joining us as part of a special crossover discussion with Chicago Tonight Black Voices are Chandra Van Dyke, project manager of the Chicago Advisory Redistricting Commission launched by Change Illinois, and Asia Butler, co-founder and CEO of the resident association Greater Englewood, also known as REACH, Juan Morado Jr., a Chicago attorney and member of the Illinois Latino Agenda Coalition, and Robert Vargas, professor of sociology at the University of Chicago. I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us today. And I want to start with Robert Vargas. Robert, your research finds that gerrymandering, like what we're seeing proposed in these maps, can have harmful effects on certain neighborhoods. What are some of the effects you found? Yeah, so in a series of papers that we've been working on, we've been looking at what happens to blocks when they are removed from a powerful elected officials wards, like someone like Ed Burke or someone who sits on these powerful committees. Uh, uh, when they leave those blocks, sometimes their 311 requests decrease, crime goes up. Um, and this in part um, is related to um, each, of the, uh, each of these aldermen's power in, in the city council. And so when you have a, a powerful elected official um, that has relationships with city departments that are really good at serving their constituents, when war boundaries shift, the blocks that are removed from that ward end up seeing a decline in city services. Um, and one other major way that this affects communities is that you have some communities like Inglewood, uh, Little Village, that are split into three, four, sometimes six districts. And that makes it hard for the communities to address problems uh, because let's say you take a problem like violence. You have some city co council members that believe that additional police is the proper response. You have others in the same community that would think that it's additional services. And so in addition to having to coordinate all of the logistics around four or five different wards, you have to actually reconcile drastically different viewpoints and how to address a problem, which results in oftentimes in not much happening or not enough happening. Okay. Asia Butler, you founded the Resident Association of Greater Englewood because of this very issue. Englewood is divided up to six different words. How does this divided representation impact the neighborhood? 
Yeah, I mean, that was one of the premises why we were founded. We felt that we all was dealing with the same neighborhood issue, regardless of the automatic board, um, boundaries. Um, and so we wanted to be addressed and approached as one neighborhood, which is the greater Inglewood community. Um, it's been difficult, you know, these last few years, um, just from our members alone, you know, sometimes they're on different sides. They're on the same block two different streets are two different aldermen and so right. we've had members who have called and said hey i've called just and just as uh, professor vargas said you know 911 but over here they're getting attention and we're not um it's been a challenge i mean in terms of investments development having one strategic plan for our community with everybody on the same page it's always been a challenge. And that was one of the reasons why we said, you know, we're Greater Inglewood, which is West Inglewood and Inglewood together. And we're one neighborhood and we'll be treated as such. Right. What kind of city council uh, representation would Englewood residents like to see, Aisha? So I've been seeing a mix. I mean, I think the most part of what our members have said for the past 10 years is one or two, um, um, at least at least two um, looking at Inglewood and West Inglewood um, with one, you know, kind of concrete, in sync um, boundary. Um, we're, we are a huge community, 55th on the north to 74th from the Dan Ryan all the way to Hamilton. And so we're, we're really large. And so we knew that one probably wouldn't work, but definitely two to get everybody on the same page will probably be much easier as we start thinking about other things that are going to happen in the future of Inglewood. Okay. Obviously, the Latino population also could be heavily impacted by this remapping. I want to talk now with Juan Morado Jr. Uh, to tell us what specific political interests the Latino community in Chicago have that makes it important to have a more proportionate representation. Well, I mean, you just gotta, I think, look at what the numbers clearly state, and that's that the Latino population has grown uh, in our city. We're now 30% of the city's entire population and what we are not seeing is a um, equal amount of representation both on the city council and within city in, in a number of different areas. So the interest for Latinos is to make sure that we have folks who are advocating for the community's interests, which are unique in many instances. Sometimes you're dealing with issues like language access, you're dealing with things like uh, the Chicago public school system now, which is a majority uh, Latino uh, students. And so those kind of unique factors I think call for representation that is um, culturally competent. I want to go back with uh, Chandra Van Dyke. You were part of a people's map effort that used community input to determine ward boundaries. Why does uh, this city ward map matter? Why should people care about how political boundaries are drawn up? Well, it's really important for people to understand that these boundaries really determine a lot more than they think, like having access to basic city resources, investment in community projects, crime rates and how we're addressing crime in communities to healthcare and access to quality education. So I think we all agree that these are all essential resources that residents need and ultimately those decisions about the access and the quality of them are determined based on who's representing you. Robert, um, the focus is largely on the words with changing boundaries, but what about the words that remain mostly intact? How are they affected by this process? Well, in many ways, they've had the privilege of not being affected for over 100 years. Uh, so some of our research has uncovered about over a dozen areas of the city that have never changed word boundaries since they were uh, incorporated into the city in the late 1800s, uh, some since 1923. And um, it's no coincidence. These are communities that are predominantly white, affluent, or uh, deeply and historically connected to the city's political machine. And going back with, back with uh, Asia Butler, there's been lots of controversy over the map discussions within city council. What are you hearing from residents in Inglewood? And uh, are there concerns about words with majority black voters possibly being reduced? Um, that is a concern. I mean, we um, started doing this work, you know, 10 years ago when the first remap happened. And our members really were steadfast about just having our wards consolidated. Um, black, brown, they, it didn't matter. It was just to have two kind of strong representations and, and city council. Um, 
our community is still 94% African American, so we don't, wouldn't see why our representation wouldn't be the same in terms of African American, you know, wards or representation of our population. Um, so it's a mixed bag. We, we we work with the People's Map. Um, the process that the People's Map did is something that I think all we all should be doing as a city, um, just so that more voices are heard in this. But our members are mixed. You know, some of them have go around to love their alderman. And so when they think about the fact that they might not have that alderman anymore because they created a relationship, they're 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 torn. They really are torn. And they also, we do see an influx of the Latinx community coming into Inglewood. And so folks are just feeling more territorial more than usual. So we really couldn't decide as right. a group if we were gonna endorse the people's map or what we we're gonna do. So we're just constantly having the conversation. Great. Well, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Obviously, this is a very hot topic these days, but thank you so much for joining us. My thanks to Chandra Van Dyke, Aisha Butler, Juan Morado Jr., and Robert Vargas. Be sure to check out Chicago Tonight Black Voices for more on the remap conversation, including breaking down the politics and power dynamics of how word boundaries are drawn. Up next, how to better connect with Latino consumers. Stay with us. In 1993, the Got Milk campaign by the California Milk Processors Board was tremendously popular among English-speaking audiences by a literal translation of the famous tagline into Spanish nearly resulted in commercials asking their Spanish-speaking viewers if they were lactating. That's just one example of how American companies have fumbled when trying to reach Latino consumers, and it can be an expensive mistake. Latinos make up 19% of the country's population, and half of them are under the age of 29. And while America's Latinos spend an estimated $1.7 trillion annually, the Hispanic Marketing Council says only 6% of overall industry inve investment is spent targeting the Latino community. Joining us now with more are Aussie Godinez, CEO and co-founder of the marketing agency Paco Collective, and Cesar Campa, CEO and creative director at Campa Design. Thank you both for joining us today. And I want to start with you, Aussie Godinez. Why do you think it's important for brands to customize their approach to the Latino market? Is there even such a thing as a Latino market? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I think that the first thing, and first of all, thank you for, for having having me here today. Um, I think the thing is that, like, to understand a couple of points, right? Latinos aren't a monolith, right? In in answering the question that, that you just asked, um, you know, Latinos come from all over uh, Latin America. Yes, we do like soccer, but some don't like soccer, right? Some speak uh, Spanish, some speak Spanglish, and others prefer all English, right? So there is absolutely a Hispanic market. The, the thing that's interesting and that marketers need to really do is the due diligence to understand who they're speaking to and really do it in a way that's authentic and genuine, that doesn't speak to stereotypes, that leverages the language in a way that's truly meant to, to resonate with, with that particular target. Right, Cesar Campa, is it, does it have to do more with, with how much the Hispanic Latinos can spend on, on why companies spend, decide how much to spend on the Latino market? I think, um, it, it, yeah, it, it, it has to do with, 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 with spending. Um, it has, like, uh, like Ozzy was mentioning, um, it has to do a lot with um, understanding the market and how, and how that money is spent and how it's applied because uh, like you said earlier, it can be a very expensive mistake um, if if you don't do your 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 diligence homework. What uh, I'm saying with you, Cesar, what are some mistakes you've seen in marketing approaches to Latinos? Well, um, there have been some mistakes where um, there have been stereotypical, uh, you could say, visual imagery that people think the general market may think that that's what uh, represents us and and in fact um we really just want to be understood uh we want to be uh we want the the brands or the services to be inclusive and to also have uh an emotional connection to the community 
therefore um, that therefore you have uh, an interactive uh, communication and, and relationship. After all, we drive the same cars and we drink the same soda, right? Osi Godinez, what are the differences between generations of Latinos? What are younger generations looking for? Yeah, that's a great question. We spend a lot of time talking to um, some of the brands that we work with. And, you know, just as you would have in the general market, you have your Gen Z cohort, your la la um, millennial, and then your, your boomer, so to speak, and then Gen X in between there. But as you look at the younger generation, we are entering a super area of transparency. Transparency is one of the things that we've talked to a lot with clients and understanding what that means, especially for this younger, very multicultural cohort. And Latinos are leading um, the conversation in a lot of respects. So, so a, a lot of it is around transparency. Um, the, um, the environment is incredibly topical right now. And then just the identity and embracing all things Latino, right? This particular demographic, the younger demographic, is really living in this idea, and we call them 200 percenters. I didn't come up with that, but I love the term. You're 100 percent Latino, you're 100 percent American, and those two things sort of bridge in and out depending on context and where you are. And so that whole generation is also super upwardly mobile, meaning it's all things digital. Um, everything right. that has to do with your telephone. So it's a very interesting, very dynamic, very fluid segment of the population. Let's talk about language. Cesar, how important is language in creating campaigns to appeal to Latinos? Well, it's very important because um, like, um, like we had mentioned before, there are different segments, uh, there are different generations, and, and you can have a different segment of of that same Latino um, market that doesn't you know precisely speak 100% um, um, Spanish at the at the house, um, but they do consume and they do behave and 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 go about their life in a Latino fashion. Um, so now when you have um, um, language that is that is that is miscommunicated that that can be that, that can be a, a pitfall um, a lot of at the beginning i would say some years ago there were many campaigns where they were literally translating the um the their commercials or or billboards and and it was just you know missing missing the boat and but now i think right. uh, things have gotten better mm -hmm. yeah i mean to your point Sorry. it's about it's about understanding yeah. the community, right? Uh, and I want to exactly. end with you, Aussie. Do you think marketers are doing a better job reaching Latino audiences in recent years? I mean, Alex, it's gotten better for sure. Um, there's we a have lot just, of room We have to just grow. 30 seconds, Aussie. So. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of room to grow. Yes, they're, they've gotten a lot better. I think you're seeing a lot more interest. They're cer seeing, certainly seeing the economic value that Latinos bring to the table. So we're certainly seeing an upward trajectory towards, you know, more active Hispanic marketing in a genuine way, for sure. It's definitely going to be interesting seeing how they market the Latinos in the coming 10 years, per se, right? So thank you, sure. both, both of you, for joining us today, Osi Godinez and Cesar Campa. Gracias, thank you. Gracias. We haven't seen much snow yet in Chicago, but we know it's coming. That means more time spending indoors where it's warm and cozy. Historically, that coziness comes at a cost to the environment. But Chicago architect Alicia Ponce says it doesn't have to be that way. Here, she gives la última palabra on how she believes those who create and maintain built environments should keep sustainability at the center of all their projects. My name is Alicia Ponce. I am the founder and principal of AP Monarch. We are a Chicago-based architecture firm. I started AP Monarch over 14 years ago on a mission to design healthy environments, designing spaces that look good, feel good, and perform great. So that's what we strive to do with every single one of our projects, with the environment in mind, with the human occupant in mind, and health and wellness. If you take a look around 
there aren't many architects that look like me in the industry. As a matter of fact, I represent less than 1% of licensed Latina architects in the U.S. and doing green building. As architects, and my responsibility, I feel, is to create and build healthier buildings, healthier architecture, because if you look around, you know, we're surrounded by buildings everywhere and they're operating, you know, almost 100% of the time. And during that time, they're operating. We have the lights on, we have the air conditioning on, heating, using water, so we can reduce that impact, that operational energy. What that means for architects is that we are in a space right now where we are fighting climate change, where we are combating climate change by building zero carbon architecture. So it's our call to action to talk to manufacturers and advocates to make these, bu these building materials healthier. When you look at green, green building, it's not always equitable. So we really like to look at that closely and recognize the co-benefits. If you're gonna do green building here, how does it, what is the impact five miles down the road, 10 miles down the road? What is that community like? Are you going to redesign your space every 10 years? What is that impact? How much of that goes to the trash? Can it be recycled? As designers, we're problem solvers, we ask questions, and we have the resources to bring those solutions now. You know, we can all be a collective and design healthy environments, you know, make it healthy for humans and the spaces around us. Who wouldn't want that? Alicia Ponce is also one of the founding members of Arquitina, a professional leadership and licensure initiative that supports Latinas in architecture and encourages them to join the industry. You can find more on uh, Arquitina and more on our La Última Palabra series on our website. And if earlier in the show, we talked about Latino market, so why not just visit an actual Latino market? The Mestiza shop in Pilsen is gearing up for the holiday season with offerings from traditional tin ornaments to earrings that look like miniature elotes. Producer Erika Gunderson dropped in on the Latina-owned store that revisits, remixes, and revives everything people love about Latino culture. The first thing you say, oh, it smells beautiful in here. The warm, woody scent of Palo Santo envelops you when you walk into Mestiza Shop on 18th Street. For many customers, especially those who live in the surrounding Pilsen neighborhood, it's the scent of home. We feel like sometimes when people come in, they might have like, uh, you know, a really rough day, but you know, when they smell like the Palo Santo that we burn in our shop, it calms them down. And so we want to bring that to people. Definitely. We just want everybody to feel always welcome here. Lorena Almanza and Sugieri Martinez have known each other since their days at Farragut High School. <laughs> the married couple opened their shop in 2017 with an eye towards offering wares made by local artists as well as imported goods. The items range from the traditional to the quirky, but all with a distinctively Latina accent. It's so important to us because we don't see ourselves in the mainstream media. We don't see items that we can connect to in the mainstream shops. We don't see them in commercials on TV. Our best sellers are definitely the Concha Pillows and the Millennium Loteria, especially right now because um, people are staying home and holidays are coming. Loterias are totally definitely a big hit. And Mi Madre Lo Hizo, all the products are made by um, a local Pilsen resident. Her name is Elizabeth and her daughter's helper in the business, but she creates all these miniature food items like conchas or like elotes. You find them in the little earrings. Another artist, her brand is called Papelitos Lindos, and she makes beautiful note cards that you don't really see at a store when you're looking for Latino-inspired note cards. So she makes things that are, you know, for like Father's Day, Mother's Day, with the Latino uh, flavor in them. The name Mestiza Shop reflects the owner's identities as much as it does the items that line the shelves. As Mexican women, we are already of a very mixed ancestry. Um, we are indigenous and we also are 
um, European. And so our Mexican culture is a mixture of those things. Almanza and Martinez say they have seen many of their neighbors' businesses in Pilsen shutter over the last two years. But robust community support helped them weather the pandemic. Yes, definitely. Because of them, we were able to pull through the pandemic that we went through because uh, we were so close of maybe closing down. Um, yeah. But, you know, because of the community and we were just we just feel so blessed, you know, that we were able to stay afloat. And they hope they can keep bringing their cultural remix to Pilsen for many years to come. For us, it's so important to incorporate the old and the new, but we're also as a community like changing and that's okay, but we don't want to lose our culture. We don't want to lose where we came from. So I think it's important to fuse those things. And I think that's what Mestiza does. We're just delighted that we can, you know, be here for the community and also do something really fun. For Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, this is Erica Gunderson. Well, the Mestiza shop offers many products online as well as uh, curbside pickup. You'll find more on our website. And that's going to be our show for this weekend. If you're watching us on Saturday night, know that you can also catch Latino Voices and Black Voices on Sundays beginning at 10. Don't forget also to tune in to Primera Hora on Univision Chicago every weekday morning. I'll be waiting for you. And I'll be back here in the host chair next week on Latino Voices. Now for all of us here, I'm Alex Hernandez. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy, stay safe. Buenas noches. Captioning is made possible in part by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Wishing all a happy and healthy holiday season.